r slash no sleep hosted by you slash drunken swordsman i was part of a six person expedition to the south pole i was the only one to make it back alive part one growing up i was always drawn to adrenaline extremity and testing my limits i started out doing relatively common stuff bungee jumping parachuting mountain climbing but like a junkie needing a greater high i always wanted something more I gathered a group of like-minded friends through my adventuring. There were five of us, two girls named Katie and Lena, two guys called David and Jake, and me, Adam. Together, we moved on to more dangerous activities, base jumping, cave diving, things like that. Three years ago, we had what we thought was a great idea, we would ski to the South Pole. It didn't take long for us to agree on this trip. Only Lena was against it, not liking the remoteness of the continent, but it didn't take much for us to persuade her. Soon, we were all planning, saving up money and researching. On November 6th, we stepped off a hired plane at Hercules Inlet, a bay in the southwest of Antarctica, and the beginning point of our 50-day ski trek. Waiting for us was our guide, Leif Steenson. Jake had picked Leif personally. He had been recommended by one of Jake's traveler friends, who had also hired the Norwegian as a guide on an Antarctica trip. He struck me as a gruff, silent man. Hey there! Jake called out as we approached him hauling our packs and skis behind us. You must be Leif, right? Yes. He answered curtly. His voice was heavily accented. And you are Jake? The very same. My friend smiled. He was a likable and friendly guy, in stark contrast to Leif's disconnected manner. We made our introductions, and our guide immediately got down to business. There are a few basic rules you must follow, in order to stay safe. Obey my commands at all times. Do not wander off from the party. Do not walk away from camp. Will we get a handbook? Katie laughed. She was the joker of our group. Leif looked at her icily. No. No handbook. You remember, or you don't go at all. Katie stopped laughing quick. After Leif had finished his briefing, we set out at last. I can't even begin to describe the scenery, nothing I've ever seen quite compares to it. Flat, endless ice sheets, spreading out as far as the eye could see, like a sea of snow. It was undeniably beautiful. It also pressed home the reality that we were alone out here, with no humans for possibly hundreds of miles. If anything were to go wrong on this trip, it could be deadly, I loved every second of it. As we skied northeast, I strayed out of line and fell in beside David. He was the most like Leif among our group, quiet and reserved, at least until he got to know people. So, when are you going to ask Leif out? I grinned at him. Shut the fuck up, Adam, he laughed back at me. I will say, though, that the way he shut up Katie was glorious. Wish more people could do that. Katie shot us a withering glare from in front of us. We both sniggered. Not like there's many coffee shops out here, anyway, I sighed. Your date will have to wait some time, it seems. After some hours of traveling northeast, Leif's voice carried over to us from the front of the column. We stop here for now. Unpack your tents. As we took off our skis and began setting up camp, I wandered over to Lena. So, how do you like it so far? I said. It's beautiful here, I'll give you that. Lena answered. But like I said before, it's so barren, so massive. I can't help but feel small and meaningless, like a fly on a wall. I'm sure you'll be fine, I said, putting a hand on her shoulder. In a month, we'll reach the Teal Mountains. That should break the monotony a bit. Lena was about to answer, but then stopped squinting over my shoulder at something in the distance. What's that, Adam? I turned, looking out over the expanse of snow. What? I can't see any. I finally noticed what she was pointing out. Far away on the horizon, something was sticking out of the ice, gray and unmoving. It was too far away to tell what it could possibly be. I called over to our guide. Hey Leif, you got a second? He came over to us, his bearded face stern, as always. Yes? What is it, Adam? Any idea what that is? I said, pointing to the faraway objects. He stroked his beard and thought. I do not know, he said finally. Rocks, perhaps? It's roughly in the way we're going, said Jake, walking over from his pack. He smiled winningly. Maybe we could check it out tomorrow. What do you think, Leif? Up for an adventure? Leif seemed uncomfortable with the suggestion. I don't know if that's a good idea. We need to keep up a good pace. Jake's right, it's roughly the way we're going, anyway, said Lena. Come on, it may be something interesting. Leif sighed. Fine. 
Tomorrow. Probably just rocks, I would say. My first night in Antarctica was sobering. Even in my tent, dressed up warmly and in a special sleeping bag, I could feel the cold. Thankfully, after some time my breathing warmed up the tent, and I fell into a deep sleep. Eight hours later, Leif woke us to break camp and set out again. As I was eating a small breakfast of freeze-dried cheese and chocolate, I saw Katie looking at the gray objects on the horizon. She looked strangely confused. What's up, Katie? I asked, walking over. Slept well? Those things. Weren't they to the north when we set up camp? She answered. I frowned, trying to remember. I think so, yeah. Why? They're to the east now, Katie said. I paused, confused. Are you sure you didn't get turned around? No, no, I checked my compass. It's definitely to the west. I frowned again. I guess we misremembered, then. We were all tired, after all. Yeah, must have been that, Katie said absently, her mind elsewhere. Wonder what those things are, anyway. Guess we'll find out soon enough. After eating and packing up, we put on our skies and set out, heading towards the strange things on the horizon. Leif seemed slightly troubled, and I wondered if he too had misremembered the direction they were in. As we got closer, we could make out what the things were. A circle of massive rectangular stones, standing on their side. They reminded me instantly of Stonehenge. Approaching them, David fell in beside Leif. I thought Antarctica never had an indigenous population, he said. Who could have made something like this? Our guide appeared perplexed. I will be honest with you, I do not know. I've never seen anything quite like this before. I thought you'd been through these parts of the continent before, said Lena. I have, but I did not encounter this. It is. Irregular. We should take a closer look. Katie grinned back at our guide. Good to see you've warmed to our little adventure, Leif. We approached the circle cautiously. Up close, we could see that the stones had once had carvings of some sort on them, although they had long been destroyed by time and wind. In the center of the circle was a low, square slab of stone. Four grooves ran from its center to each corner. What the hell? Whispered Lena. How did this even get here? Aliens? Smiled Katie. Isn't that always the answer? I walked over to the central stone. It was dark, about knee height, and featureless. For some reason, it made me strangely uneasy, although I couldn't pinpoint why. I touched it hesitantly. It was completely smooth, unlike the rest of the circle. We should continue. Leif called out. We have a timetable to fulfill. We can write down the coordinates and, once we return, tell someone who will know what to do with this discovery. Slowly, our group pulled back together, and we set out again. The expanse stretched out around us, completely featureless, and I was glad we had an experienced guide like Leif. Every so often, he would take out a compass and check our heading, making slight adjustments every time. I slept better on our second stop, knowing that the cold would get better eventually. I talked with Lena before I went to bed, and she confessed that the stone circle had made her feel uneasy, as well. It shouldn't be here, she said firmly. This place hasn't had any native people. Ever. It's only scientists and tourists, and why would they possibly make something like this? Maybe Katie's right, I smiled. Aliens. Lena groaned theatrically. You're all underestimating how important this discovery could be. Maybe we've accidentally stumbled on proof that the history of this continent was completely different. I hope not, I don't want my name in a history book being my legacy. We both laughed, the unease of the situation relenting somewhat. When I woke, I could tell something was wrong. I could hear hushed voices talking outside my tent. I climbed outside, rubbing my gritty eyes. Leif, Lena, David, Katie and Jake stood in a huddle in the middle of our campsite. They were talking quietly, and casting furtive glances to the west. I looked over to where they were looking. On the horizon, far away, I could see a familiar circle of grey stones. A chill ran down my spine. I walked over to my friends. How is this possible? I asked incredulously. Those things should be to the south of us. They shouldn't even be close enough for us to see them. Leif silenced me with a gesture. We have been talking about it, Adam. The only logical explanation is that this is a second circle. It is. Strange, to say the least. I have never heard of a stone circle in Antarctica, let alone two. Do we go investigate it? Asked Lena. No, replied Leif resolutely. Yesterday's detour already put us off our timetable. We must press on. I will write down these coordinates, and we will pass them on to the experts later. We packed up and set off. 
A strange hush had fallen on our group. The second circle had affected us strangely. I could tell the others were disconcerted by them now, not just me and Lena. During the day's hike, I only talked once, with Katie. I was hoping her joking attitude would help me relax. So, aliens, huh? I said, skiing next to her. That a professional opinion? She grinned at me, but I could tell she was troubled. It's obvious, isn't it? She answered jokingly. What else would it be? Maybe Leif put them there to scare us? I suggested. Did you see him looking at them? He was confused too, Katie said, suddenly serious. And he's been through here before, how come he didn't see it? Maybe it was snowed under? I suggested. I've read that the landscape can change a lot here. Our conversation trailed off, and we remained silent till we broke camp again. Before I went to sleep, I noticed David scanning the horizon. It was a clear day, and we could see miles away. What you looking at? I asked, walking over to him. Snow and ice? I'm making sure there's no bloody stone circles around here. David replied. I laughed, but he didn't join in. I went to bed, once again feeling uneasy. A commotion in the camp awoke me suddenly. I tore out of my tent, not even getting out of my sleeping gear. David was shouting, cursing. What's happening? What's going on? I yelled. David stood on the edge of our camp, gesticulating wildly at the western horizon. My heart missed a beat as I saw what he was cursing at. A circle of grey rocks. My friends came out of their tents, confused and sleepy. Their confusion quickly turned to an uncertain fear. How is this possible? Lena asked. I don't know, answered Leif. Even he seemed troubled, and he kept checking his compass, as if confirming over and over that the rocks were indeed in that direction. I was about to suggest we go investigate, but David cut me off. Where's Katie? We stood in silence for a second, turning, looking around. Leif ran over to Katie's tent and unzipped it. It was empty. Not even her sleeping bag remained. Our group fell quiet for a second. No one knew what to say, what to do. Leif broke the silence. There are footprints here. Looking closer, I saw he was right. Booted footprints were impressed in the snow, going from the tent entrance, around it and away from the camp. We followed after them. Soon, Lena threw her hands up in frustration. What the fuck? She exclaimed. What the fuck is going on? Peering past her, I could see what had angered her. The footprint stopped. Suddenly and without any warning. It was as if Katie had suddenly flown straight up into the air. We gathered around the place they ended. Jake cleared his throat. Leif? He began. What's the plan, man? What's our next move? Leif was silent for a second, staring at the abruptly ending footprints. Then he looked at Jake. We have to search for her. She has to be here somewhere. We will spread out into a line and. He trailed off as something on the ground caught his eye. I looked down. Our movement had upset the snow, showing ice beneath. It was oddly clear, almost like frozen glass. Through it, we could see something red, a piece of fabric, frozen deep below the surface. Leif cleared his throat audibly. Clear the snow below us. We set to work, moving the snow with our gloved hands. Soon, we could see what lay below. Jake cursed savagely, and Leif crossed himself. My breath stopped short as I realized what I was seeing. Frozen solid in the ice below, lying in her bag as if she was still asleep, was Katie. Posted by you slash drunken, swordsman. I was part of a six-person expedition to the South Pole. I was the only one to make it back alive. Part 2. I went on a skiing expedition to the South Pole with four friends and an experienced guide. Things didn't exactly go to plan. If you're confused, you should start at the beginning. Lena sat down in the snow, her breath coming in panicked gasps. David and Jake stood paralyzed, staring at Katie's frozen form. I grabbed our guide by the shoulders, turning him to face me. What the fuck, Leif? I shouted. How did this happen? What the hell and going on? Leif looked at me. His face was like carbon rock, but I could see a gleam of fear in his eyes. I don't know. He replied, almost whispering. But we must return. We have to get out of here. What, and leave Katie behind? Said David incredulously. You can't be serious. There is nothing we can do for her. She is dead. We have no pickaxes to dig her out, and even if we did, what would we do then? Leif was somehow remaining calm. We need to return. Whatever is happening out here, we must escape it. We must go back to Hercules Inlet. What is happening here? Yelled Jake, his anger flaring up. Who? 
What did that to Katie? Leif looked at him. I don't know, he said finally. I am as scared as you, Jake. But if we wish to survive, you have to listen to me. We have to turn back, now. A shocked silence fell on our group. Slowly, we picked ourselves up, and headed back to camp. David stayed the longest, looking down at Katie's frozen form through the ice. I put my arm around him and led him away. As we packed up and prepared to leave, my eyes kept returning to that damning stone circle. It seemed even closer than before, mocking us, threatening us. We set out in mournful silence. The weather, fair for the last three days, was taking a turn for the worse. Snow and wind began gaining in strength. Finally, Leif stopped the group. We must set up camp before the conditions worsen. He announced. We set about the task. As we worked, Leif continued talking. We have to maintain a watch in the night. I will begin, and after an hour and a half, I will wake up Jake, and so on. This way, we will not be vulnerable while the others sleep. What are we guarding against? Said David, his voice low. I thought this place was abandoned. Antarctica has never been truly settled, no. Leif replied. Only scientists and tourists come here, I believe. During World War II, the Germans briefly established a base on the coast, but that is all. I couldn't help but notice he had cleverly evaded David's question. We erected our tents in dejected silence, everyone occupied with their own morbid imaginations and fears. As I settled into rest, I could hear Leif's footsteps outside the tent as he paced back and forth, keeping watch. My guard duty was not up for another three hours. I lay, thinking about Katie, forever where we had found her, frozen in the ground. I couldn't get her face out of my mind. At least she had died in her sleep. Eventually, I fell into a slumber from pure exhaustion. I woke some time later. I could tell it had been far longer than three hours, I was feeling far too rested for it to have been such a short time. Climbing out of the tent, I saw Leif. He was sitting in the center of the camp with his back to me and his hood up. Leif? Everything all right? I said. No answer. My heart began beating harder. Leif? I called out again, praying for an answer. He remained silent. Slowly, I walked over to his sitting form. He didn't move an inch. I put a hand on his shoulder, and turned him around. The others ran out of their tents as my scream tore them from their slumber. They found me, standing above what I had thought was our guide. Except it wasn't. It was Leif's clothes, filled with snow and shaped into the outline of a man. From the hood, a smooth globe of packed snow and I stared outwards. Shit, 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 oh fuck, oh, shouted Lena, turning away from the figure. David was staring at it, completely motionless. It was Jake who woke us from our horrified trance. Guys! Look! We stared at where he was pointing. Of course. A stone circle. This time to the east. David ran to the edge of the camp and screamed towards it. What do you want? He yelled. What do you want from us? I rushed over to him, Lena behind me. We put our hands around him, and gently led him back to the camp. We have to keep moving, Jake said firmly, assuming command through force of will. Hercules Inlet is only two days away. We can't stay here. What difference does it make? Mumbled David. We have to keep moving. Repeated Jake, his voice firm. We won't achieve anything by staying here. We broke camp and set out. David was visibly lagging behind, his eyes blank. He was in shock. I took turns with Lena, the two of us making sure that he kept moving, and trying to take his mind off the situation with conversation. While Lena was in the back of our group with him, I went next to Jake. David's falling apart, man, I whispered to him. I don't know how long he'll hold it together. Or what we'll do if he collapses. Jake looked at me. I could see the resolve in his eyes, so barely holding him together. In that brief moment, I truly admired his willpower. It's two days to Hercules Inlet, he said. If we just keep moving, we'll make it there. David will keep it together, he'll have two. And if he doesn't? We'll think of something. No one gets left behind. Jake turned and pressed onwards, our conversation clearly at an end. We pushed on. The loathsome stone circle had now abandoned all rules of logic and space. It moved seemingly randomly, always on the horizon but never shifting in a way consistent with our movement. I grew to hate the sight of it. Somehow, I had no doubt it was connected to everything that had happened to our group. By the time we stopped to make camp, David had recovered somewhat. He was still distant and brooding, but I hoped he would be alright for the time being. We quickly agreed there was no point in standing guard over the camp. Whatever had happened to Leif, 
It had happened while he was on watch, and he hadn't even managed to raise the alarm. We had a strange, naive sense of security while we stayed in our tents, like children hiding under their blankets at night. Even so, falling asleep was hard. The ever-present terror and foreboding, the fear of being taken next, it was hours until exhaustion finally put me to sleep. I dreamed that night, a horrible nightmare. Someone was opening the front of my tent. I lay in terror, holding my breath. The zipper went down. A grasping hand grabbed my legs and pulled me, kicking and screaming, into the snow outside. A dark, hooded figure stood above me. It reached down with gloved hands, going for my neck. I flailed wildly about, searching for a weapon. My hand tightened around a skiing stick, lying in the snow. I lashed forward, driving it like a spear into the figure's throat. Blood spouted out. It gurgled horribly. I woke. I could immediately tell something had happened in the night. Lena was crying outside, low, heaving sobs. Jake was comforting her. Silently, dejectedly, I climbed outside. David? Jake nodded grimly. Gone from his tent. Footprints? Yes. Where do they lead? Instead of answering, Jake pointed, gesturing behind me. I knew what I would see, but cursed loudly anyway when I saw the damn stone circle in the distance behind me. It was a lot closer than before, about a mile away. We should go check it, Jake said, although I could tell he didn't expect to find anything good. He may still be alive. We didn't break camp before setting out. I think there was a slight hope shared among us, that if we hurried, we would find David, that he would somehow be alive. As we approached the circle, we could see something was lying on the central slab. I gestured to Jake and Lena to wait. Stay here. I'll check it out. They didn't argue. I walked into the circle cautiously, and approached the central slab. I almost vomited when I saw what was on it. David, covered in blood. It was running away through the four grooves on it, a frozen trickle leading to the four corners of the stone on which he lay. His throat was speared through by a ski stick. My ski stick. I retched, gasping for air, I couldn't have done this. I had been sleeping. Had I? Was it a dream? Was I sleeping? I stumbled back to the others. Lena saw my expression, and her face fell. David. Is he? Dead, I said hoarsely. I wish we had cried. I wish we had mourned our dead friend like people should. But no tears would come, no deep sorrow. Only a emptiness inside our souls. I think that we were all too numb, too shocked, to process the situation enough for an actual reaction. Some leftover survival instincts or self-preservation force kept us moving. We packed up our tents and left. It was some four hours into the journey, when Jake stopped us. Guys, look. What is that? We turned, half expecting to see another stone circle. Instead, we saw a small, square building, rising from the snow. It seemed uncannily out of place in the frozen expanse, like it had been dropped here by accident. Do you? Do you think we should go check it out? Whispered Lena. It's not a stone circle. That's gotta mean something, said Jake. We should have a look, at least. What do you think it could be? I asked. Jake shrugged. Science base? Maybe? There might be people there. Maybe they can help us. Maybe they know what's happening out here. We set out towards the building. The closer we got, the clearer it became that it hadn't been used in a long while. Its cement walls were smoothed and half snowed under. Its iron door hung on the hinges, rusted in a jar. I guess Leif was right when he told us about the Germans, said Lena, pointing at the door. Impressed on it in fading paint was a large black swastika, above the words on an erba. I whistled under my breath. So what is this? Secret Nazi base? I thought they only had a small one on the coast? Said Jake. Doesn't seem like it. I answered. Do you think we should go inside? We were quiet for a few seconds, weighing our options. Lena finally answered. Yes. Maybe we can find some answers down there. Or a weapon, or something helpful. The door swung open with a resounding creak, and we crept slowly inside, into the dark and the cold. The passage led downwards, seemingly cut into the ice itself. We found the first body in minutes. It had been preserved by the cold. A young man, dressed in a dark military uniform. He gripped a pistol in his hand, and a bullet wound marked the side of his head. Next to it lay a battery-powered light, which Jake picked up and tested. Somehow, it still worked, casting a slim, flickering ray of sickly yellow light through the tunnel. More bodies, lying everywhere. All of them, gripping guns, with bullet wounds through their heads. I shivered. 
What the fuck happened here? Jake swallowed audibly. I don't know. Looks like some sort of mass suicide. We continued down the passage. Doors led off to the sides from it, opening up onto rooms filled with antiquated machinery and workstations. There were also several libraries, much to our surprise. At the end of the corridor was a large iron door, much heavier than the others. We stopped in front of it for a second, apprehensive and fearful. Lena broke our reverie. Oh, to hell with it, she said, leaning forward and pulling on the door. It budged open with a loud screech. Jake shone the light into the room beyond. We squinted into the dark, looking upon a massive chamber, tens of meters wide and deep. My heart dropped when I saw what it contained. Is. Is that what I think it is? Asked Jake hoarsely. I nodded grimly. Before us, dominating the center of the room, lay a massive circle of gray stones. Posted by you slash drunken, swordsman. I was part of a six-person expedition to the South Pole. I was the only one to make it back. Final. I went on a skiing expedition to the South Pole with four friends and an experienced guide. Things didn't exactly go to plan. If you're confused, you should start at the beginning. We stared in mute terror and disbelief at the massive construction. Well. Shit. Muttered Jake. There's things painted on the ground, Lena said. Looking down, I could see she was right. The circumference of the stone circle was drawn on the floor with dark paint. Within, it was filled with stars, suns, and strange geometric shapes that made my head spin just from looking at them. Peering into the center of the circle, I could see that there was a body on the central slab. The dead man was sitting cross-legged, frozen in his final, fatal position. Looking closer, I noticed he didn't have a gunshot wound like the others. A piece of paper, folded and yellowed with age, lay before him. Guys, come have a look. This one left a note. My friends joined me. Lena took the paper tentatively and opened it, careful not to damage the ancient page. I can translate this. You know German? Asked Jake, surprised. Lena looked at him, slightly amused, even in such a place as this. How long have you known me, Jake? Seven, eight years? She looked back down onto the paper. It's very confused. The poor man was probably already half mad when he wrote it. Does it say anything about what happened here? I asked, my breath making clouds of steam in the cold air. Yes. It. It seems they were sent from Germany to carry out some sort of. Experiment? Ritual? It's unclear. The Ananerba were a weird pseudo-scientific group, sometimes dabbling in the occult. This sounds like something they would do. What kind of ritual? I asked, a shiver running down my spine. He doesn't say. All he knows is, they needed these stones, and a place where no man has ever lived. The stones were ancient, found in some old warlord's grave in Europe. The Germans didn't even know exactly how old they were, or who made them. And the suicides? Does he say anything about them? Yes. After the ritual was complete, strange deaths started to plague the base. They couldn't escape, Germany was being beaten and no one answered their calls for help. Rather than be taken by. Whatever they had called into being, they decided to commit suicide. And this guy? What happened to him? He didn't kill himself. He says he was the one who carried out a sacrifice on the central slab, and he wants to know what he has brought onto this world. He says he won't kill himself until it comes for him. We stood in silence, digesting this cryptic information. I couldn't help but think about the man's fate. He hadn't killed himself, and he hadn't been killed, despite being the one actually carrying out the ritual. It was the cold or the hunger that did him in. We shouldn't stay here. We have to keep moving, or we'll never reach Hercules Inlet, said Jake finally. We nodded in agreement. Quickly, we returned through the passage. First Jake, then I passed through the door. Lena was following. She never made it out. The door swung closed behind me with sudden, brutal force. I jumped, and Jake cursed. Lena. Get me out of here. Lena screamed from the other side, terror twisting her voice. Get me out. I grabbed the door, pulling at it with all my strength, but I struggled in vain. It wouldn't move. Jake joined in, groaning and panting. Lena was beating on the door in panic, screaming and crying in fear. We pulled and pulled at the door, but it wouldn't move an inch. Get me out. Get me out. Get me. Suddenly, her voice cut off. The hammering on the door abruptly stopped. There was silence. No. Screamed Jake. He tore at the door desperately, but still it wouldn't open. Lena? I said, my voice quivering. There was no reply. She's. She's gone, whispered Jake. 
It's taken her too. Help me open this fucking door, man. I swore desperately. Together, we pulled again and again, but the door simply wouldn't budge. After half an hour, we collapsed into the snow, exhausted and defeated. I don't know how long we lay there. Our minds, stretched to their limits, had finally had enough. This time, though, the tears came freely. After some time, I picked myself up. The hollow, empty feeling of shock had returned. I had no more s. We keep moving. We can't stop now, I said. Jake nodded, but I could see the desperation in his eyes. We will make it, Jake. We will. My own voice sounded hollow, a mockery. Jake didn't notice. We slung our packs and continued north. The following day is a blur in my memory. Grief, shock and exhaustion had taken its toll on us. We were moving from muscle memory alone. When we stopped and set up camp, we remained silent. What was there left to say? Even if we got out of there alive, could we really live on like before? Through some mute communication, we decided to sleep in one tent. It gave us more of that naive sense of security, even though it had not protected David. Or anyone else, for that matter. When we awoke, we breathed a silent sigh of relief. We were both alive, both present, both lucid, or at least as much as we could be, given the circumstances. Once again, we shouldered our packs and set out in silence. The circle was on our left now, unmoving and sinister. I kept glancing over at it, almost expecting it to move closer to us. Jake seemed to be pointedly ignoring it, refusing to even look in its direction. After several miles, he spoke up, the first time I'd heard his voice in hours. Do you know what's the first thing I'll do once I get out of here? What? I said, confused as to where he might be leading with this. I have no idea. Go to Stonehenge. I stared at him incredulously. Why? Why in fuck's name, of all places, would you go to goddamn Stonehenge? Jake grinned. To take a shit on the stones there. I was silent for a second. Then I started to laugh, a hysterical, insane laugh. The type of laugh only someone on the brink of death, pushed beyond his limits, can have. Jake joined in as we skied forward. You can count me in on that, man. Yeah. Revenge is B. Suddenly, there was a sickening, tectonic crack from beneath us. The earth shook, and we swayed to keep our balance. The ground fell away. We had been traveling over a hollow in the ice, and without warning, it gave way. We fell downwards, only a few meters, but the skis affixed to our legs made our landing clumsy. As Jake hit the ground, he let out a scream of pain. The air was knocked out of me as I hit the ground. I gasped, my lungs burning. I crawled over to where Jake lay. Are you alright? No, he said through clenched teeth, his face twisted in pain. I think. I think I broke my goddamn ankle, Adam. My heart dropped, but I forced myself to my legs. Come up, I'll help you. Jake leaned heavily on me, and I slowly raised him to his feet. The second he put weight on his leg, he almost collapsed again. It's definitely broken. Fuck, Adam, it's broken. Let's get out of this hole first, I said, forcing myself to remain calm. We had to take this one step at a time. Thankfully, the sides of the hole we had fallen into were sloped, making a crude causeway for us. Slowly, painstakingly, I helped Jake get out of the hollow. Every step, he would wince and gasp in pain. Once we were on the surface again, Jake sat down onto the snow. What do we do now? He said. I can't walk. I can't ski. I didn't know. Let's. Let's just stay here for now. Rest your leg. Maybe it's just sprained, and we can continue later. Sounds good. Answered Jake, but I could hear it in his voice, we both knew his ankle was broken. No amount of rest would help him. While Jake rested, I took a ski pole, it had been Lena's, and broke it in half. I cut a length of rope from our supplies, and approached Jake. What's that? He asked. Splint. I answered. He smiled thinly. Didn't know you were a certified field medic. I'm not. But if it helps you walk, it's worth it. I tied the makeshift splint to his leg. Jake hissed in pain when I tightened the rope. All right, doctor. Let's see how well this works. Swaying and grimacing, he raised himself upright. He took several steps. I could tell he was still in pain. We tried pushing on. Once again, I came to admire Jake's willpower, even in horrible agony and at the end of his sanity, he didn't give up. But it quickly became clear we wouldn't make it anywhere like this. It took us two hours to go a mile. At the end of it, Jake collapsed into the snow. 
I returned, kneeling beside him. You need to rest, I said. We'll move on later. I'm no use to you, Jake whispered. I'm just slowing you down. We'll never make it with my pace. Don't talk like that, I said, anxious for my friend to not lose hope. It's true, Adam. He answered, looking up at me. I'm just dead weight now. And whatever's hunting for us, that damn circle. It won't let us leave, will it? It's been playing with us all this time. He laughed, but it was an empty, morbid sound. For all we know, it's been leading us in circles, anyway. Oh, the irony. Circles. Just rest, Jake, I said. You'll feel better afterwards, I swear. He was silent for a second. I, I think I know what it wants. What? I asked, dreading the answer. What are you talking about? The circle, Adam. The man we found on the altar, he made a sacrifice to it, and it didn't kill him. If you make an offering to it, it may not take you. What offering? What do you? I trailed off, realizing what he meant. My heart stopped in terror. No. You can't be serious. Just think about it. I'm useless to you. I'm just slowing you down, and if this thing feels like it's not going to get what it wants, it'll just kill off both of us. My blood ran cold at my friend's words. I can't do this. You know I can't do this. We don't even know if it works like that. Jake looked over my shoulder, and laughed grimly. I think we do. I think it just sent us a message. I looked up, and started in shock. Somehow, even though we hadn't moved, we were now sitting inside a circle of grey stones. Looking back down, I realized that Jake was actually sitting with his back against the horrible altar itself. Jake. I. Please. Let this be my last sacrifice, a last act of friendship. Let my death have some meaning, at least. Grimacing, he pushed himself upright, using the altar as support. Stretching his arm out, he placed his ski stick into my cold hands. I. I won't do it, I said, my voice quaking. Jake looked me in the eyes silently, and my heart broke. You have to. Slowly, he lay down on the altar, folding his arms on his chest. Tell everyone what happened here, Adam. Tell them not to come in our footsteps. This thing. It won't stop. It will always want more. We can't allow that. You have to get out of here, to stop that from happening. He closed his eyes. I approached him from the side, tears welling up unbidden. In nerveless hands, I raised the stick above my head, as the cold, grey stones watched on in silence. 